about hope because of change. And when I thought about his, uh, the title of this gospel meeting that's going on here, I thought it was very good because man's issues oftentimes, um, not oftentimes, but man's issues are all, I got small ears, okay? So we're going to figure this thing out one way or the other, all right? There we are. So anyways, let's talk about what we're going to talk about for a lesson. I have three, four things which we want to do. Numero uno, we want to define hopelessness. This is the antonym. This is the opposite of hope. But we want to define that, and then I'm going to show you some biblical examples of hopelessness. Second, what we're going to do is we're going to define hope biblically, not from Webster's dictionaries, but we're going to take a, uh, a uh, 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 this thing is going to work with me, man. Just bless me. My ears are small, okay? <laughs> I, when I get one fixed and nothing falls off, <laughs> Hamburger. Okay, well, the second thing we're going to do is define hope biblically. Number three, we're going to define repentance, i.e. change. Okay, and we're going to look at the scriptures for that. Because like I said, my title is hope because of. That factor is what is going to allow us to have this hope, which we're going to define, is predicated upon, and it rests upon the fact of our repentance and our willing to change. And that's just not me. That's all humanity. All right. So that's point number three. And number four, I want to offer hope to every uh, offer the hope that every child of God, that every Christian has to anyone in this audience that might not be a child of God. So we must always uh, uh, offer hope. We must always leave a person feeling like there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And so that's what we aim. That's what we set out to do. That's my itinerant for the time that's allotted me. All right. This thing's going to keep falling, but that's all right. All right. I'm going to work with this thing one way or the other. I'm going to have to pinch it over like this. Okay. And then we'll make it work. All right. Let's talk about hopelessness. Let's define this word right here. And I'll show you the opposite of it. Hopelessness is a feeling or state of despair beyond optimism, desperate. How many of y'all are familiar with Hannah? Y'all remember Hannah? And do you remember what Hannah wanted so bad but she couldn't have for the longest? What was that? It was a child, was it not? And then then her husband's other wife would oftentimes vex her sore. In other words, he would talk about her. She would talk about her and give her a hard time because she would not have it. And he says, well, I'm not better than you with all these sons and things like that. And so you can see just by jogging our minds very, very, very uh, shortly, you can see how she might have had that despair or she could be desperate or doesn't really have uh, optimism in something that could change, okay? But yet and still she prayed to God, and that's a great example. Hopelessness. Here's another definition. The moment you realize that everything in your world is wrong and there's absolutely nothing you as a person with meaning your own physical attributes, you can't change that one thing. You cannot go out and fix this. You're totally uh, reliant upon someone else. Any of us ever been lying in a hospital bed? I used to work in uh, the medical field. And any of us ever had to have somebody come and pull that slip so they can move you so you don't get bed sores? Any of y'all know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever had to have somebody come and wash them or do something because you didn't? You're completely dependent on somebody else. There is nothing that you can physically do about that. Can you see how a person can become and have a mindset of despair? Could. How it could happen, all right? What are we talking about? Hopelessness. Hopelessness also is a loss of confidence that future events or occurrences will be positive. Do you remember the prophet? You remember Elijah? You remember how Elijah uh, got a little bit discouraged because of oh, Ahab? Do y'all remember that? And, and the Lord let him know that there is a lot of prophets who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You're not the only one. But sometimes we can lose confidence because the, like, like him, that brook that, uh, that, that brook dries up and that raven, that bird stops coming. And we can lose confidence sometimes in certain things. So that's hopelessness, a loss of confidence. And all of us, beloved, at times have points in which we feel like despair, like I'm trying my absolute best, but it just doesn't seem to work on. But I'm going to try to show us today with this text we were working with that hope is our anchor of the soul, as we were singing earlier. Hope is our steadfast anchor of the soul. All right. Now, let's look at a few examples of hopelessness in the Bible. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And it's going to be very quick. We just talked about a few, but I wanted us to read a few of these here. Genesis chapter number 37. And then let's get started at verse 18. This is a New King James Version I'm reading from, all right? 
Genesis chapter 37, and let's start at about verse uh, 18. You know about what Joseph, remember him, right? You remember how his dad had made him that coat, that tunic of many colors. You remember that, right? And you remember how uh, the dad showed favoritism. You remember that. All right, so let's start uh, Genesis 37, verse 18. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben, that's the older brother, heard of it. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness. And do not lay a hand on him that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it, so, so it came to pass when Joseph had, had come to his two brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. They took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Let's stop right there and ponder for a second. And I want you to put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Put yourself, uh, uh, sympathize and empathize with Joseph. Imagine you are being betrayed by your brothers. Imagine you went out here to check on your brothers, and now all of a sudden you find yourself in this, bo- in this pit right here. It's probably dark. There's no water or anything else in it, and you don't know what's going to happen. Can you, can you see how when we talk about hopelessness that there's sometimes a feeling of despair, that there's, you're in a situation in which you can do nothing about? You can't crawl out of this pit. What can you do to change this situation, right? What, what could he have done? What is it that Joseph could do to get himself out of it? Let's keep going. It says, verse 28, and it was, uh, let me go back to 37, verse 28. Verse 28 says, verse 28, where's 27, 28, verse, when we start about verse verse 24. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in Verse 25, and they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of the Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, myrrh, on their way to carry them down from Egypt. Just think about this. Your brothers are sitting out here eating a meal while you sit in the pit. This is what this is what hopelessness to me looks like. And you know the rest of the story. They sell him off uh, uh, to the Ishmaelites for 20 seconds of silver and they take Joseph to Egypt. All right. So that's that moment you realize that everything in your world is wrong and there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. The only thing that the child of God can do in that particular situation is pray to God. And fully commit, uh, commit, double down, you know, just com- completely double down. Let's get a New Testament example and let's show, uh, uh, if we will, of this hopelessness and then we'll show a solution for it. Let's look at Luke chapter 24. So let's see what the beloved physician and inspired historian has to say in Luke chapter 24. And I'll make sure I'm in the book of Luke in the chapter 24 this time. How about that? Luke chapter number 24. And let's start at verse 13, Luke chapter 24, and let's start at verse 13. Luke chapter 24 and verse 13. You remember those two men on the road, uh, uh, on the road to Emmaus? Y'all remember those? All right, so let's read Luke 24, verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they uh, talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. So they don't recognize him, right? Verse 17. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? So here's Jesus putting himself into this conversation. And he wants to know about this conversation. Then Then the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him are you the only stranger in jerusalem and have you not known the things which happened there in these days and he said to them what things that's jesus talking to them so they said to him the things concerning jesus of nazareth who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before god and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him Now watch verse 21. Watch it. But we were what? 
We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And because they did not see him, they were without what? They're without hope. They're without hope. You remember what ancient Simeon said in Luke chapter 2? You remember how ancient Simeon said how he could die in peace because he'd seen the Messiah? You remember how Anna the prophetess would serve and so forth like this? And so here are examples that we can see. Why do we bring this up, preacher? Why do you bring this up, Brian? Because all of us have times when we might not fully understand certain things and we can have a feeling that comes about us of despair or of hopelessness. All of us have various things that we deal with. There's no two ways about it. You remember Moses? Moses said, Lord, it's, it's too much. If it's not, I would that you just kill me. This is what Moses is saying. I'm taking my word for it. It's in the book. Do you see my point? You know, how many times did Paul pray that something would be removed, that thorn? Three times. You see what I mean? All of us go through various things. So you and I are not out our alone. Luke 24, 21. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem the Israel. And then the Lord lets him know it really is. It was him. So now let's define hope. Uh, from the New Testament. Let's define it from the New Testament. And I'll give you this definition up here first, and then we'll go to Titus chapter 1. How about that? But hope is a confident expectation. I've said this many a times. Hope is a confident expectation of an eternal life with God. When he returns because of Jesus the Christ shed blood and obedience to the gospel call. In other words, it's not wishful thinking. I am confidently looking forward to something. Those men on the road to Emmaus were looking forward to something. They were looking to see the body of Jesus from that tomb, were they not? They saw an empty tomb. They heard the confirmed word, but they didn't see him. But he's right there with them, but they didn't realize it. You see that? Until he opened up their minds and he said, you know the rest of Luke 24. So there is a confident expectation of an eternal life, that celestial abode, all right? Uh, a, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, with God, the Godhead, right? When he returns, when we all shall see him, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and it's because of Jesus Christ shed blood. Isaiah 52 through 53, the suffering servant, his visage is marked more than beyond any than you can recognize. By his stripes we are healed, right? You know what I'm talking about? Because of the shed blood, Revelation chapter 1, verses 4, 5, and 6, because of the shed blood... And it's obedience to the gospel called 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at really about verse 12 and work your way down to about verse 16, all right? That gospel called the invitation to accept uh, 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 God on his terms and ultimately repentance and baptism for the remission of your sins, all right? Now, let's get 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, then we got First and Second Thessalonians. So let's get First Thessalonians chapter four and verse number thirteen. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse thirteen. What are we trying to do? Show hope. What are we trying to do? Give us a better understanding of hope and compare it to what the world thinks and how hope is a confident expectation. What are we trying to do? Give us a reason not to hang our head. To show us, no matter, be not dismayed, whatever be God be tied. Who's going to take care of us? You know the song. God will take care of you, right? So what are we trying to offer to us today? Hope. That's what we're trying to do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and let's start at verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. He's talking about brothers and sisters who are in the body of Christ. Concerning those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died. Lest you sorrow as others who have no what? Hope. Let's slow down right here. Let's make sure we understand it. What's the, what's the application, uh, Brian? We should not sorrow over a faithful Christian's death the way the world sorrows over the death of a loved one. Because it's a transition. Do you see that? In a moment, in a twinkling of eye, 1 Corinthians 15, you remember that, right? It's something that's so much better. He's conquered the grave. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, where is to death, where is your sting? Where is the victory? You, you see it? Because Christ has conquered the grave. We sing that song. So we should not sorrow as others who have no hope. Verse 14, for if contingency predicated upon, for if we believe, here it is, 
that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with, uh, with him those who sleep in Jesus. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. What's the point? There's more to life than this right now that we see. And there's going to come a time when ultimately we're going to rise if we've already passed from labor to reward. And if we're still living, we won't precede those, but we'll see him coming. Can you imagine this scene right here? So let me ask you something. What can you and I be faced with that's worth throwing away this hope? So you throw me in the dungeon like Jeremiah in Jeremiah 38. You leave me in that dungeon and I'm by myself and you leave me to die. Am I supposed to curse God now all of a sudden? Am I supposed to lose hope all of a sudden? But here's what I understand our Lord to let us know. With every temptation, the Lord will make a way of what? Escape. He won't allow you to be tempted above that at which you're able to stand. So if you're going through something, it's obviously because God, and, and remember, if we suffer as a Christian, we rejoice, we glory in that behalf. But God is ultimately knowing how much we can do. Let me give you the example. Look at Job. God controlled the whole thing, did he not? The whole time, the whole time. So it's a confident expectation. Let's get Titus chapter one. I got to hasten here. Uh, and make sure I got a whole lot to get to. I got about 30 more slides. <laughs> Let's get Titus chapter number one. Titus chapter number one. What are we talking about? A confident expectation. Here's Paul writing to Titus. He had left him in Crete and he sends Timothy to Ephesus. And he tells him to set in order that which is lacking ordaining elders. Let's look at Titus chapter one, verse one. Paul, a bond servant of God. An apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness. Watch it. Watch what he says. In hope. In hope. In hope of what? Eternal life. What's my definition? A confident expectation of what? Eternal life. You see this? We're, 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 we're looking for something far better than this. We understand that a lifetime compared to eternity is but a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. What's my point? In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised. This is why I don't waver. Because the builder, the maker, the creator, the sustainer, the one who hangs the universe. Think about it. The earth doesn't get off its axis to the left, to the right, any more than what it needs to. It stays in perfect alignment so that we don't freeze and so that we don't incinerate. And this one who's holding it all together, who cannot lie, he's promised this. So this is my confident expectation. But has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. All right, let's get Titus chapter 3. Stay in that book right there. Titus chapter 3, and let's look at verse 4. Let's look at verse 4. Talks about how we were once foolish and disobedient, deceived, and we hated one another. We had all sorts of lusts and other things like that. Then he says in verse four, but when adverb of time, but when the kindness and the love of God, our savior toward man appeared, when the word became what flesh John one fourteen and dwelt among us. He says, when the love of God, our savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Does that not sound like Acts 2.38 to you? All right. Through that washing of regeneration, i.e. baptism, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Is that not Acts 2.38? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through who? Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the what? Hope of eternal life. What's my definition? A confident expectation of an eternal life with God when he returns because predicated upon what God did in sending Jesus the Christ and how he hung on that cross for six hours. Prior to that, he was beaten, lacerated. He shed his blood. Prior to that, they put a crown of thorns on his head and he bled. And prior to that, he had, had, had such mental anguish or agony that his sweat became as uh, uh, drops of blood. 
And so what are we talking about? That Christ shed blood and obedience to that gospel call. We're talking about hope, a confident expectation. Now, in order for us to have this eternal abode with our Lord and Savior, we got to change some things. Ain't no two ways about it. Here's, here's what rubbed me rose. Listen to me. I'm, I'm going to get off the, I'm going to get off my, I'm going to get on the hobby horse for a second, okay? But I'll be right back, okay? This is why I have PowerPoint. So when I veer off, I can get right back. Is that okay? I've been working in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in Bible class. And 1 Corinthians chapter 7 in Bible class is, do y'all know about 1 Corinthians 7? It deals with marriage. And listen, anytime you start dealing with that stuff, oh, 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 oh. people are going to gnarl on you around. But you got to still teach the truth. you got to still teach the truth. The discussion came up, and the discussion was about, ultimately, repentance. And does God require the infidel who's been out here and married 20 different times to Joe Blow or, or, or Susie, whoever, Susie Q, does he require them to repent? Can they stay in that same marriage? Does it do right here? And I said, well, and, and brother, brother said this, Brother Jerry says, well, Brian, uh, 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 if you rob a bank, you get fifty thousand dollars. And he said, he said, if I rob a bank, and I said, brother Jerry, I never knew you could do such things. But anyways, he said, he said, if I rob a bank, Brian, and I get fifty thousand um, dollars, and I get baptized that night, do I have to give back the fifty thousand dollars? And I said, well, uh, yeah. That's part of repentance, bearing fruit, but meat for repentance, bring forth fruit. And he said, and he just, that was it. And he left it like that. You see, his point was, if I re- my repentance requires me giving this up, if it was wrong prior to, it's still wrong afterwards. That's the point. And you got to repent of it. So hope, we have a confident expectation of heaven, but it's predicated upon us changing. We have to conform our will to his will. In order to have this, you don't get to dictate to God what is going, how you're going to do this thing. It's not going to work. All right. Let's look at a text, Luke chapter 24. We were already there. And let's look at verse 47. And he's going to say what he wants preached. And he's going to have them tarry in the city of Jerusalem. And the first gospel message is going to be preached in Acts chapter 2. Now let's look and see what he says in Luke chapter 24, starting at about verse number 47. Uh, actually, we start at verse 46. Uh, then he said unto them, this is written, thus it was written, and thus it was behooved, or it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Watch it. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. See, you can't have the forgiveness of sins without having a change. And, beloved, that's what repentance is. It's about faith. It's a 180. So when you see this picture up here very vaguely, you can see this. this it's a big old thing. You've got to go the opposite way. We're not saying make a full 360. We're saying do an about face, a 180. So repentance is a change of mind that will result in a change of action. And I will show you that scripturally, all right? Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter number 21. You cannot, and we all understand this, if a person say that they, that they repent but they still do the same thing, you and I call them a liar. You call them out, you ain't repentant, you just report it. And, the really reason, and some people only, uh, only, only, they don't really have godly sorrows, we'll say, they're only sorry that they got caught, all right? But ultimately, you and I, if a person asks for forgiveness, we have to have, offer forgiveness, we got to have forgiveness in our hearts. Matthew 21, and let's look at verse 28. Watch what, watch what our Lord says. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. Oh, that's a hard-headed son, is it not? That's a hard-headed son. That would not go well with my daddy. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he, he, he what? He, he regretted it. King James, he repented it and went. Verse 30. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Whether of the twain, which of the two did the will of the father? Well, it's a simple choice, is it not? One of them just told a flat out story. The other one was flat out rebellious, but he repented. He regretted it. And then he went. So what are we showing here? Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of action. You change your heart. And in order for us to have this confident expectation, we have to change our heart. In order for you and I to have the hope of heaven, we are going to have to change. 
And there's no two ways about it. You cannot continue in the muck and mire of sin. You cannot continue to still be rude and ugly and short. Well, that's just the way I am. I can't help it. I got a hair trick. All these other excuses we come up with to justify our lackluster, sinful behavior. That dog won't hunt. Not today and not tomorrow. And there's a lot of people going to have a rude awakening come judgment day. I'm not your enemies because I'm telling you the truth. I know it is. Sometimes our children sass mama. Oh. <sighs> Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. It's the truth. Sometimes children sass their folks, right? Listen, last time I checked, Ephesians 6 is in the book, right? It talks about fathers bringing their children up in the nursery and admission of the Lord. And it talks about children, does it not? Children obey your what? Parents in the Lord for this is right. You don't get to choose which commandment you want to keep and not keep. If you're going to have the hope of uh, a confident expectation of heaven, you're going to have to change some things. You're going to have to change that back. By Titus, Titus 3 says, speak evil of no one. Let that marinate. How, many, how easy it is for us to speak evil of someone and start gossiping and backbiting. Yeah, you know, saying says, and he don't even have on a tie. I'm talking about me because I don't have a tie today. <laughs> I got to tease myself sometime in this thing, too, okay? But you understand what I'm saying? It's easy for us, if we're not careful, to speak evil of this. Matthew 5, 44 tells us to be perfect, be complete, be mature in Christ. There's no substitution for this, beloved. We have a hope because of change. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. I got to go ahead and start wrapping this thing up. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 10. What is hope? It is a confident expectation. Why is that? Because of God's love for humanity. What did he do? He sent his son to the world, and he became flesh, and he submitted his will to the Father's will, and he died on that cross for you and I. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 10. 2 Corinthians, I'm in 1 Corinthians 7. I've been teaching 1 Corinthians 7 so much. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And verse number 10. Now, we can actually start really at verse 9. He says, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to, here it is, repentance. It led to a change. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Verse 10, here it is. For godly sorrow worketh or produces a repentance uh, not to be repented of or a repentance leading to salvation, not to be repented or regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. See the difference? You know, you can learn certain things the hard way. If, if you choose to be the prodigal son, don't mean that you're always going to make it back. There's a lot of people that didn't make it back from the hog pen. I'm telling you what I know from experience. You don't always get to make it back. So what am I saying? Yes, God has done all of this for you and I. Oh, what love. The psalmist says, who art man that thou art mindful of him, right? He's done all this for you and I. But it is predicated upon you and I, a change and full commitment to him. There's no two ways about it. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9 and 10, I put it up there. Paul says, for I'm the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, we're going to come back to that verse. But... By the grace of God, I am what I am. That is an apostle. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. It was not empty. It was not wasted. Notice what he says. But I labored more abundantly than they all, than the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. What was Paul's motivating factor? He realized and he viewed himself as a chief of what? Sinners, you can never repay back God meritoriously for 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 what he has done. The only thing that you and I can do is demonstrate our love by keeping his commandments and being zealous. Ephesians 2 10. We are his workmanship created in him for what purpose? Good works. Good works. So we got all this good news. We, got, we have this hope if we're Christians, but it's not meant to just be squandered and wasted. It's meant to be applied. It's meant to be shared. We're meant, we're meant to be ministers to other and do good, all right? Hope because of change. Acts 26, 20. I'm going to hasten. Acts 26, 20. Watch, he says, But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent 
and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So we have a hope. You can become a child of God. In Acts chapter 18, verse 8, many of the Corinthians hearing believed and they were baptized. And at that point, he, he translates us, our brother said it in his prayer, into the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 2, verses 10 through 12. All right? Uh, 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 the, through the washing of regeneration, Titus 3. We, we, we are now have our names written in the Lamb's book of life because of our obedience to that gospel call, 2 Thessalonians 2, we were to- uh, quoting earlier, right? Verse 11 through about 16, okay? That call in which you obeyed, all right? So, so the gospel went through Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. And then he says, you know, obviously the Gentiles hear it. And what is the point going like right back to Acts 24, that they should repent and turn to God and do works, meet for repentance. Work is not a dirty word. Let's define this context real quick. Repentance is distinguished from the act of turning to God here, okay? And one actually turns to the Lord at the point of baptism in the conversion process, all right? Acts chapter 3. Let, let me make sure I'm, I'm, I'm not going too fast. Let me make sure I explain everything that I mean. Your sins are not forgiven until you are coming out of that watery grave of baptism, but you have first realized, you have first believed, you've heard faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. John 6, 44 and 45, all those who have heard and learn come to the Father. So it's predicated upon you learning and faith comes by hearing. Well, you hear that you have sin and that you've missed the mark and that you have godly sorrow for what you've done and you repent. You have a change of mind that will result in a change of action. But you don't actually become a New Testament Christian until you put the Lord on in baptism, Acts twenty two sixteen. And why tearest thou? Literally, get thyself up, get thyself baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, invoking the blessing of God. So one actually turns to the Lord at the point of baptism in the conversion process. It's not a sprinkling. It's not a pouring. It is immersion. That's what the word baptismo or baptisma literally means. All right. Let's go a little bit more. The penitent life. It's characterized by doing works. And we've seen that just a minute ago, did we not? Paul said, I work more, than, more abundantly than all. I did more than all of them. So the penitent life, this person that says that I'm a New Testament Christian, is evidenced by the life that they live. You know how many people you know to say they're, they're a Christian? How many people you know to show up on Sunday and they throughout the week, they still do the exact same thing? They... They still talk bad. They still watch stuff. They ain't got no business. They can gossip and everything else. Go out with the girls and drink cocktails. Do anything and everything under the sun. I'm talking about people who name the name Christ. And I ain't no, so, so naive not to think those things go on. It should not. There's a whole book of Corinthians letting us know that these things happen in the church at times. The penitent life is characterized by doing works. A changed life mode of conduct that is reflected in zealously pursuing the will of God. Hope because of change. All right. Of course, God wants all sinners to change. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but as long suffering toward us, to us were not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. My Calvinist friends hate this verse because they simply believe that only a few people has God predestined. But he has foreordained the grace of God that, appear, that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, Titus 2.11, teaching us. All right. So he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you and I all to have this hope. So let's talk about it. Let's let's summarize a few things here. Let's make some application. Without God, we are hopeless and no amount of worldly possessions can ever give us peace. I want you to think about that. When it was all said and done. Now, Hezekiah was a good king. It was none in Judah before him or after him like him. What the Bible says about Hezekiah. But Hezekiah got sick. You remember? Hezekiah had a boil. And Hezekiah was going to die. God told Isaiah, get your house in order for you are going to die. You're not going to recover from it. What's that? Second Kings 18. 
right? Isaiah 38, somewhere in there. And you're not going to recover from it. And all the good that he had done and everything that he might have amassed as a king didn't matter. And what was he wanting? He was wanting to live. And he cried and the Lord heard him, right? So your worldly possessions can never give you that peace that passes all understanding. It is only in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3, we're all spiritual blessings. Without God, we are hopeless, and no amount of worldly possessions can ever give us that peace that passes all understanding. Number two, no matter what happens to us in this life, we have, uh, 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 we have a building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In John chapter 14, the disciples are saddened because Jesus is going to go. You remember that? And Jesus says, in my Father's house are what? Many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would tell you. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. All right? And we have a building, eternal in the heavens. Uh, This building is built without mortal hands. Number three, you cannot have hope, that is a confident expectation of heaven, if you're not willing to change your will to his will. Jesus is a perfect example, is he not? That's why he's a master teacher. He prayed in the garden. He prayed and he prayed. But then he came back and said, not my will, but thy will be done. You cannot have a confident expectation if you're not willing to change. And you're fooling yourself if you think you can be lukewarm and make heaven. Some of us have become so callous and so ugly toward our spouse and toward other people. I don't care what I ain't got to do all this stuff. And we wear the name Christian and you think it's going to work. Some of us don't, have not exercised forgiveness. Judgment will be merciless to the one that shows no mercy. What are we talking about? The fact that we're going to have to change some things. James lets us know that we need to look into what? In the mirror. We got to look in the mirror, right? We got to look right here in the scripture. We, it, 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 there's no two ways about it. There's no two ways about it. Sometimes we can see a big tree trunk, and a, a little moat in somebody else, and, and, and somehow forget the big tree trunk in our own eyes. All right, let's get this last one. Hope is our anchor of the soul. Hope is our anchor of the soul. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Hope is the anchor of the soul. Hope is what will keep you in those most difficult times. Hope. There is no two ways about it. That confident expectation that the Lord is going to return. That confident expectation knowing that God who cannot lie. We have hope and eternal life. Can't you just see that celestial abode? And John, the, and, and when he writes the Revelation, he says on the north three gates and on the south three gates, he says there's no more sea, and the sea represents separation. There's no, there's no more sea. And he talks about there, there's no need of the light because the light there is so bright. Can't you just see those pictures of heaven? Does it, want, does it not want, want to cause you to stay even further committed? Does it cause you to reflect and really think that, that I'm, Light affliction is but, but for a moment. And when you start to think about the things that you're going through and you, and you compare it to what the Hebrew writer says, he said, you've not even yet resisted to blood. What are we trying to do? I'm trying to stir your soul. I'm trying to stir your soul. I'm trying to, to make sure that all of us don't waver, that we don't turn back to perdition like the Hebrew writer says. I appreciate your time. I, th- I appreciate you listening so well. You, you, I've already went over Acts chapter 18. The question is, do you have hope? The, go, the gospel is for all, beloved. It is for all. It is for all. And the Corinthians were, were very wicked. <laughs> no two ways about that. They were doing stuff even when they were Christians that wasn't going on in the world, 1 Corinthians 5, right? But if you don't have that hope, there's no reason that you can't leave today. Again, you hear that gospel message that our Savior died for men and rose on the third day. You believe that message. And according to that message, you're buried in a watery grave of baptism for the remission of your sins. And you come out of that watery grave, a new creation in Christ. All things having passed away, behold, all things come new.